All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us in this uh, last presentation slot. And happy to talk to you today about um, how you can potentially, you know, develop multiple websites in parallel. So my name is Martin Anderson Klutz. I'm currently a solutions engineer with Acquia. But uh, during the time I was working on uh, the project we're going to be sharing with you today, I was uh, working in the same roof as my co-presenter, Chris, at uh, Northern Commerce. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Chris McKinnis. I'm an account director here at Northern Commerce. So I've uh, been working in uh, with Drupal for five years plus um, and doing a lot of uh, government and municipal builds um, as part of that, uh, mostly on the client side um, in terms of uh, strategy. Um, so our purpose in, in um, talking to you today is uh, to give the example of um, our client in Middlesex County. Uh, it's a small county in southwestern Ontario. And their IT department um, was, you know, pretty lightly resourced, uh, and they supported a lot of local townships who had their own websites, as well as um, a library, uh, emergency medical service, and the county site itself. So I think about eight, uh, eight sites in total, all of which were on Drupal 7 we had built at some point over, over previous years. Um, and... Each of those townships really had uh, very, very little resources themselves, either to maintain or even content manage these sites. Um, so they had partnered, you know, the, the county was doing some central IT support. Uh, when it came time to refresh and rejuvenate these sites, they're really looking for a super low maintenance option. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, ways you can do multi-site um, setups. Uh, Martin will touch more on the technical aspects of that later. Um, but this was like a super low budget, um, super light lift, light maintenance um, objective. So uh, that was really what was driving our decision making and planning. So um, the specific situation we had was um, uh, we had built two websites for, uh, for municipalities within the county that had, um, had a, a reasonable budget to do their own sites. And in some of the, finding some of the synergies between those two sites, um, the county said, hey, we have another five small townships that really don't even have this kind of budget. Um, can you come up with a way that we can give them each a Drupal site that they can maintain? And it was important for them um, not only to have sort of a light, um, a light lift technically and something that was easy to maintain, but um, they really wanted the independence um, of the sites in case one wanted features that others didn't. And uh, they didn't want some of the technical dependencies that could come from uh, something like a, a true multi-site approach. So we came up with a, a prospect of um, presenting them with a really sort of productized install. So um, whereas we'd really normally do a very in-depth discovery and a very bespoke build for um, a municipality because these were really very, um, we knew exactly what they needed. Uh, these four municipalities had seen what we'd done for two, and two other clients previously, and they were able to say, yep, that's fine. We'd be okay with that. So rather than uh, a full you know, custom build, we really looked at, okay, well, you're basically gonna get some custom options on the front end. Um, you can have, you know, here are two templates. You basically get version A or version B and whichever sort of front end uh, appearance you like will apply your, your colors and your logos to that. And that's pretty much the extent of customization um, that comes with the package. So in terms of from an agency perspective, that was great. Um, we'll come into some of the challenges um, from a client perspective later, um, but uh, that was our approach in terms of uh, positioning and, and dealing with the client. And uh, I'll let Martin talk about how we actually did that. So what we wanted to do was continue to build on an approach that we had actually started using a couple of years prior in a project where one of the larger hospitals in Toronto had wanted us to build two sites in parallel, one as their site and one for their foundation to do fundraising, and um, didn't want to go the multi-site route, were insistent that they had to be separate and had to be built in parallel, and so we had, had developed an approach there that had worked reasonably well. We had actually reused that approach when we had built those first two sites 
uh, those first two municipal sites for the county of Middlesex. And so we decided that, uh, you know, given some of the parameters of uh, what we were trying to build here, that it would be a good idea to sort of uh, continue to build on that and actually expand on it. So where before we were building kind of two connected sites, here we decided that it would make the most sense to actually make a single template site and effectively clone that out into the individual sites that would act as, as the sort of, you know, web homes for, for each of those municipalities. Another aspect of our, of our approach was uh, something that we had been doing for a little while called scaffolds. And, and really what these are is a Drupal module that really contains typically no PHP. So actually just YAML files. So it's, it's a way of um, bundling together uh, configure, site configuration that represents kind of the uh, almost like a logical or a functional unit of a website. So it could be something like a staff directory, an events calendar, um, an alert system. You'll see a few other examples in a couple of minutes. It uh, really allows for uh, modular reuse of kind of um, approaches to common patterns that we see when we build different websites. And uh, another aspect of it that can be helpful is that uh, because the um, all of the naming is going to be exactly the same from one build to the next, other things like, um, let's say, CSS selectors that might live in, in the front end theme is actually more portable between projects because of some of that consistency that it drives. <clears throat> so the process of creating a scaffold is actually pretty easy if you're using Drupal console. So really just these... Uh, Three commands here. The first one will actually generate the directory and the YAML file. It'll give you the option to also create a file, but you actually don't even need one for a typical scaffold. The second command is actually to export out the content type configuration as well as any dependent configurations. So it might be things like uh, your field definitions, if you've used, set up any uh, custom view modes, um, those kinds of, of configurations. And then the third is really your configuration for the view, or potentially you could run it once if you've created multiple views to, to work with that content type. Now, if you had been, I guess, planning in advance, you have the opportunity when you run this first command to actually tell it any uh, additional modules that should be listed as dependencies in that info.yaml. But typically when I've made them, I find it's easy to just generate all the config and then if you do a scan through all of the um, config files that it's pulled together you can actually see what the dependencies are compile a quick list and then manually put those into the info.yaml and then kind of the only uh, other tricky part is really trying to figure out what's going to be the best way to organize the uh, configuration between sort of your uh, config install directory and the config optional directory um, essentially, the, the critical distinction is that it, um, the module will stop and error out if it can't install one of these, but if, let's say, there's a missing dependency for one, uh, one of these, then it'll keep going and just install what it can. So um, you're going to run into fewer errors if you, if you have more in the optional subdirectory, um, but the flip side is that if you have everything, for example, in the optional subdirectory, it's possible that uh, because you have some kind of a, of a key missing dependency, it actually won't install anything. So it may take a little bit of trial and error to find exactly the right balance if you decide to take this approach. So in this case, what we did is we took one of the uh, sites that we had built uh, originally for Middlesex County, and we exported out a number of different of these uh, scaffold modules. So alert systems, an events calendar, staff directory, job listings, uh, areas for uh, services, meetings, bids and tenders, and even um, to give their <clears throat> web team better control over what would be, you know, promoted on the homepage, we had specific ones for uh, using callouts and quick links on the homepage. So we exported those out into scaffolds, <clears throat> partly because we didn't want to just do a straight clone of the of the site entirely. At, at Northern, the approach was to use uh, kind of a, a custom curated install profile for all of our Drupal projects. And so there was kind of an evolution in terms of the best practices, uh, the versions of things that were being used between when this module started and when we were ready to start our template site. So we really wanted to start with, um, you know, kind of a fresh capture of, of the uh, best of breed install profile and then port over 
uh, the functionality that we thought could be reused. And then once we had that, we basically had kind of the rough structure of the site. So we created out the, the four clone sites that were going to be the uh, municipal sites. So from there, um, let's talk about some of the other implementation details. So um, typically when a lot of our dev teams would want, would need to do multiple sites, the, the preference would usually be to do them kind of sequentially. So build the first one, uh, get that signed off and launched, and then start on the second one. But again, uh, we didn't want to do that because particularly with some of the smaller uh, municipal sites, there's a process of getting them launched that it um, often includes things like uh, council approval and depending, first getting it onto the agenda and then making sure it doesn't get from the agenda um, can do, push out the launch windows sometimes. And we didn't want, for example, you know, the fourth site that was going to be launched in that kind of a sequential process to keep getting pushed farther and farther out. So we really wanted to get these done in parallel. And that mean, meant uh, effectively doing that cloning process, but we didn't want it to be a case where having cloned them, we would sort of lose the ability to, um, to still have the efficiencies of kind of creating uh, additional improvements to the uh, overall template site and being able to push those down to the individual sites. So we decided that we would um, reuse an approach that, that really uh, leverages some capabilities that are built into Git and GitLab. So uh, don't need any kind of a, a you know, fancy additional system to be able to, to uh, create this mirroring. Essentially, we're, uh, we created forks of the original repo and then set up mirroring repositories, which is a feature that's put into GitLab. Now, I'm sure if you're using GitHub, there's probably something equivalent. Um, but uh, for this example, GitLab was what we were using. And then we also used uh, protected branches as a way to give some manual control, control in the process, as we'll talk about in a minute. So uh, mirroring repositories is actually typically intended for uh, mirroring out from your local uh, GitLab repo out to an external repo. But as we'll see, it actually works pretty well for being able to manage between repos uh, within the same GitLab instance. Um, Really, all you need to do is put in the URL. Again, typically this would be external, but you can put an internal one as well. Um, I, for uh, this particular project, um, we always did a push from the, the template out to the children, but uh, depending on how you were setting everything up, you could definitely uh, push or pull. We also use password and authentication, but you could use SSH keys and, and there are other methods as well. So once we had set it up for all of the sites, you can see uh, we put in kind of usernames and passwords. It stores those hashed within, um, within the, the database. And um, it will show you how they're configured. It will show you when it last attempted to sync and when the last successful update was. And so if there's a difference there, then you know you've got some kind of a, a problem you need to update. But um, if you are using GitLab and you want, want to find where this is, once you go into your repo, in the, the bottom left of the uh, control panel, you'll see this uh, settings area, and it's the uh, repository tab in there where you can uh, make these um, uh, set up this configuration. So the other thing uh, to, to mention, we made use of this option to only mirror protected branches. And that's really because we wanted to have some control in terms of how the process would take place between the template site and the, the forked repos. So, what we, what I didn't really want was, as uh, some of our developers might, let's say, you know, make merge requests and those get merged into master to to have it constantly syncing those out to um, the four individual repos. It just uh, would put a lot of strain to our, you know, CI systems. And um, typically, it would be better to sort of wait until we knew we had kind of a, a set of features that was ready to to push out to those. And so that's where we use these protected branches to, to give us that manual control. Uh, left the master branch as not a protected branch and set up this uh, sync branch as a protected one so that periodically when I had decided that we were ready to do some kind of a sync, I effectively would just merge whatever commit in the master branch over to the sync branch, which would trigger GitLab to do its automatic sync out to the uh, protected sync branches within each of the other repositories. From there, I would go through the process of merging from the sync branch into that repo's master, 
Uh, I would use this uh, X hours flag on the, the merge command, which basically tells GitLab to, to if there's any kind of a conflict between uh, incoming changes from the sync branch and what's in that local repos master branch to treat the master branch uh, changes as the ones that should be preserved. And that worked really well in terms of really avoiding conflicts and making sure that any work being done locally in any of the repos was always preserved. Once I had done one and validated that it hadn't sort of introduced any unexpected behavior, then I would obviously follow that same process with the other three. I also created some small shell scripts to sort of automate the process. There aren't a lot of processes, but having gone through a similar process with uh, those other two projects, I knew that um, sometimes, you know, there, there can be a few things to remember. Uh, always remembering to use the XRS flag is definitely important. And so I wanted to make sure that um, it could be automated enough that, that nobody would have to worry about uh, potentially sort of doing the wrong thing. And so created these two scripts. I effectively use permissions to, in the uh, template repo, only have the sync out script as executable. And then within the other four, um, sort of like township, repos only had the sync in script uh, executable. And so that way, um, by leveraging the, the permissions, nobody had to worry about potentially running the wrong script in any of the environments. Theoretically, if you wanted to, you could make it more automated. So part of this sync out script could uh, basically trigger all of the, the individual sync in scripts and you would just run one script to have everything happen. But I really wanted to have the, the step of being able to validate that nothing unexpected was happening when I did the first uh, merge in, and really it only took a couple of months to sync out the rest of them. One of the other things that we had observed in the other two projects where we had used this mirrored repositories approach was that doing the, um, where we would get most of our uh, merge conflicts was really in the front end assets. So because there might be local changes in certain SAS partials and then incoming changes to other SAS partials, um, the CSS files would have all kinds of merge conflicts, particularly if they had been min minified. And so what we decided to do for this project was to actually build those assets in the CI process and exclude them from the repo, which meant that um, unless there were any uh, changes that were conflicting in the actual SAS partials, uh, we basically wouldn't have to worry about any kind of conflict. And so uh, this was a huge time saver for us and, and definitely made the overall process uh, much, much easier. Also wanted to share an example of something that had been requested partly through the project. So one of the townships had uh, requested to have a tax calculator built. So built this kind of a system that has these um, tax rate entities where they can attach uh, specific rates for you know, municipal, county, and education rates. And then what would happen is this was all residing in a block where a visitor to the site could put in a property value and select one of these uh, tax rates. And that would make an Ajax call to the back end where it would calculate all these values and return them back and uh, be populated in the site. So not a lot of work, just a nice little custom module, but it seemed like the kind of thing that, you know, could be used by all of the sites really, or potentially, you know, other municipal sites down the road. So decided to uh, do that as something that would be built as part of the upstream template site and effectively merge that down into all of the other repos, but only enabled it for the one site that had actually requested it. So I wanted to talk about how the approach that Chris mentioned about really combining those together into one project as sort of a single budget allowed us to, to put a lot more finish into the overall build than we would have been able to do um, you know, if they were sort of four small individual uh, Drupal site builds. So we were able to do things like have the uh, page headers have responsive images, use lazy loading for the rest of the images on the site. We were able to use modern uh, image formats like WebP and SVG, as well as an SVG sprite for the social icons. And even do things like make sure that the uh, theme was preloading the fonts, which is often one of the things that um, checks like Google Lighthouse will ding us for if it's not set up in a Drupal site. I seem to have. There we go. Oh. Finally kicked it. All right.
So um, there are also a number of efficiencies of scale um, in this approach. So partway through the project, uh, Drupal 9 had been released, and we could see that there was um, a good number of the modules that were ready to go. So uh, decided it was time to kind of uh, map out the final modules that needed to be updated to be Drupal 9 ready. And we were able to, to get uh, first the template site and then individually each of the township sites upgraded to Drupal 9 and Composer 2. And that entire process really took less than a day. So um, hopefully that gives you a sense of um, you know, how this kind of an approach can, can make even some things that, that technically can be a bit tricky, um, much more efficient overall. So in terms of some of the outcomes then, we were able to get three of the four um, township sites launched already. There's one that's that's going through that process of council approval. And we've heard now that they actually want one new site. So uh, that development is about to begin. Um, here's a, a look at how some of those uh, sites have tested. So you can see the, the Lighthouse score isn't perfect, but again, for you know, a low budget Drupal site, I think these scores are pretty good. And especially the accessibility is one that, that we put uh, quite a bit of work into. Um, web page test score here, uh, pretty pretty good results ac across the board, except for the CDN, which obviously, for uh, from a budgetary standpoint, wasn't something we were going to be able to adopt. And here's some more results. Um, I'll try and make these slides available later on. I think these actually could have been um, even a bit better than than what we're seeing here. But if I recall correctly, um, the site that was being tested here had one large image that was uploaded as a ping. So Again, with maybe a little bit more, um, you know, content guidance, um, this this site could even test a little bit better. So, finally, wanted to share a little bit of analysis in terms of, you know, how we felt this process went and when you might consider it to be a good approach to take. I would say, compared to some of the other multi-site approaches, um, it's definitely a little bit more complex to get set up. Um, it does have the advantage of being portable, so it's, it doesn't um, tie you to a specific uh, hosting partner. But on the other hand, it does require you to have, you know, an actual hosting environment set up for each of the sites, which, uh, depending on how you're doing that, could, could potentially increase your cost. From a technical standpoint, some of the lessons learned that we had uh, were really that you should have a hosted environment for that template site. In this case, we didn't, and I really felt, felt like there were some hours lost in terms of um, during the initial QA, getting changes pushed to one of the township sites so that they could be QA'd and then actually having to, um, you know, overwrite things that were intended for a different townships and things. So um, that I feel like would have definitely made us more efficient in the overall development process. Also, because this isn't you know, sort of a, a standard approach that um, the agency used all the time. There were definitely points where it, we needed to have additional documentation. We onboarded a new developer towards the end of the project, um, and he needed a, a lot more guidance in terms of really understanding how the overall process would work. Um, and so I would say if you were planning to take a similar approach, you know, uh, build a little bit of that kind of extra documentation and guidance into your plan. I mentioned how the uh, the CI asset builds uh, were definitely a much better approach in terms of some of the Git headaches that we had on those original two projects. Um, but there was definitely an appreciably longer time to, to actually do the CI builds because of that. And also that sort of CI script and, and extra setup is, you could say, techni uh, technical debt in the sense that, you know, it'll require some ongoing maintenance um, you know, when you do things like update the version of PHP, you probably need to do that for the container that runs those CI builds and some of those other kinds of things. Um, and then finally, just to, to sort of reiter reiterate that for me, it made a lot of sense to uh, build in that template site as much as possible, um, especially for functional pieces that might have value to other um, township sites, even if only one of them had specifically asked for it. Okay, so I just wanted to speak a little bit to uh, the client facing side of the engagement um, and some of the uh, unforeseen challenges that uh, that this gave us. Um, the technical approach was great. Uh, everything worked as expected, um, but something that we hadn't really anticipated with uh, this efficiency that we we're creating and with sort of productizing um, the, the website uh, 
you know, development process meant that um, whereas normally um, as, a, as a development partner, we'd really want to be working with our clients throughout the build, have them in there early learning, learning, you know, how to, how to enter their content for the different content types and that kind of thing. Um, the clients were really very divorced from that process because it wasn't uh, custom to them. And so some of the some of the municipalities really just weren't engaged, and that lack of engagement went meant that you know um, three, four, six months later, when the client was ready to to get their site up, they really weren't prepared for the content entry. And although this is a challenge for lots of projects, um, it was kind of exacerbated by this um, this kind of productized uh, approach. So just something to keep in mind that uh, separate your clients from the process that much. Um, they're going to need a little more support when uh, when they do loop back into uh, to that pre-launch phase. And yeah, I think that's basically uh, basically it. We want to make sure we have lots of time for questions. So that's great, guys. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions in here. Um, so the first one, um, I think they're asking, uh, is the CI only in the protected branches? So the, the CI would actually kick in um, when we did the merge from the sync branch to the master branch. So effectively, we had it set up so that any push to master would uh, trigger the CI builds. OK. Um, why a custom entity for the tax calculator rather than something that could be easier for them to maintain, upgrade later, uh, contributed or core modules? Uh, when should one take that leap? So um, I referred to them as uh, custom entities, but the truth is that it actually, I'm sure we used, um, it was actually a contrib module called storage entities. Um, so it's, they're custom in the sense that they're not nodes. Um, personally, if, if things aren't meant to be shown on their own uh, within a site, if, if it's the kind of thing that you're eventually going to rabbit hole anyway, because you don't want people to access them directly, then I try to avoid setting those up as a content type, and and uh, this storage entities module is perfect for that. Um, there okay. was, I, I guess, maybe the one thing I could add: there were controls built into it, so that it's like if you were logged in as an admin and looking at that widget, you would see options to basically like create a new tax rate or manage the existing ones and and edit them all from there. So it's not as though it was sort of like um, because we went that that um, you know, custom or storage entities approach that it made it any, any more difficult to maintain. We, we tried to put thought into you know, making that process to manage it as easy as possible. OK, um, let's see. How are the config updates done on the site when changes are deployed? So the way that we had it set up was in the dev environments, Whenever you uh, do uh, a new deployment to dev, it would basically trigger an automatic import of the config. Um, but initially, when we had done those those first two initial websites, the the client was going into the um, the production site and making configuration changes. So not the not necessarily the township, but at the county level. And because they had sort of the the you know root or you know user one access. Um, and sometimes making configuration changes without really letting us know. And so there were a couple of times where uh, we had deployed some features we'd been working on, and then they sort of rang us up a day or two later and said, you know, hey, we had made some changes on the site, and now they're not there. Can you let us know what happened? So um, after some discussion, we decided it was better, particularly for the production environment, to, to make that configuration import a manual process. And, and I think Typically, what we would do is, is effectively, uh, before doing a deployment to production, pull down the database, and if there are any configuration updates in there, effectively commit them to the repo so that um, when we do the, uh, the push up to dev, that those, uh, those changes are actually already baked into the configuration. OK. Um, what's the advantage of storage entities versus paragraphs? So uh, I would say storage entities um, well, so number one, they use the um, core kind of um, entity API, which paragraphs, as far as I understand, don't. Um, paragraphs are also, um, you know, like paragraphs are, are extremely robust, right? Like it's a big module with a lot of features, and that's great. 
if you need all of that functionality, but if you really just need the ability to um, create small bundles of things, then I think paragraphs is, is potentially overkill in some of those cases. So since we weren't using paragraphs elsewhere on the, on the website, we used uh, storage entities for, for that particular use case. Great. Um, I was going to ask a question, but you got to it about um, uh, site, one of the sites um, being converted over to Drupal 9. Uh, and it sounds like that was pretty, pretty painless, to be honest. Yeah, so actually one of the things that we had done, um, I guess it was about a year and a half ago when, when the, the Drupal 9 uh, readiness initiative really started to pick up steam was when we would do code sprints and some of those things, we actually took a look at that, um, that standard install profile that, that, uh, we had been using it at the agency and, and to identify where the gaps were in terms of, you know, the modules that we know we've got used on, on a bunch of sites that we built, um, which ones were, were not yet ready for, for Drupal nine. And so when we, we tried to participate in some of those code sprints, we would really focus on the modules that we knew our clients were going to need. And then that meant that, uh, once we got to that point of trying to, to start moving some of our client sites up to Drupal nine, um, a lot of those, those modules were already ready and, and that made that process much easier. Really smart to, to kind of do that homework too. Um, we have, I, I've, I'm on several projects that we've run into some problems with leaning too heavily on a module that hasn't really been ported over yet and isn't possibly ready or will be ready for, for Drupal 9. There's usually not too much that needs to be done to get those. So we end up having to take those kind of in and uh, do it ourselves. Okay. Uh, there's another question. I know config merge at deploy time. Had you considered using config auto export contrib module to automatically export the change configs? So I'm not sure if if it's uh, config auto export, but I remember hearing. I think it was in a talking Drupal podcast. I want to say a couple of years ago. It was top down configuration. I think was the name of the episode where. Um, it was another agency. I can't remember if it was media current or a different agency. They were talking about a process they had set up where it was sort of that on a daily basis. Um, it would run a cron job that would export any config changes. Um, the process they had was really slick because it would basically put those into a merge request so that one of their developers could review all of the config changes and make sure that there wasn't kind of anything goofy in there. And then if everything was good, then it would get merged into master. And that way, when, you know, other changes got mer merged up, we're already in repo. So to me, that sounds like it's kind of the gold standard. That's sort of like the best, um, config workflow I've, I've really heard of, but, um, you know, I think we had had some discussions about, about trying to get something similar set up, but, um, you know, uh, certainly not while I was, while I was there was, did we actually get that accomplished? So, uh, maybe something for the future. Okay. Um, so Allison has a question. Uh, conceptually, one of our biggest struggles is deciding when to add functionality to our template site because of potential bloat on. Do you have this issue? I wouldn't say that we tended to worry about, um, bloat too much. I mean, the, um, the scaffolds that we talked about are, are pretty tiny in terms of the actual code base. Um, if you were talking about adding some, you know, fairly heavy modules, I can see they're, they're potentially being a concern. Um, but I guess one of the advantages of the approach is that you can easily, um, you know, you can use composer within each of the individual sites. You can, um, pull modules into individual sites as you need them. And, um, and it shouldn't really create any issues. Yeah. I think also just in our use case, the, um, the template site itself is pretty pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And we had actually done an exercise to kind of um, strip out any any unneeded bloat from that template before we uh, applied it to the to the new sites that we're going to be using it. All right. Uh, and there's a, another question from Allison. Uh, do you include demo placeholder holder content in your template site that gets included in child sites by default? If so, how? 
So we actually didn't have any kind of a, you know, default content. I can see where that would add value. I had played with the open wide distro uh, two or three years back and it has a module that'll do that. And I can see where particularly for, you know, like a training type exercise, it would help to, for clients to, to see, you know, like navigation with uh, items in there and to have, you know, the front page populated with content, I think. Um, as part of our QA process for each site, we, we would um, just have somebody populate things, make sure that things line up properly and, and some of those other things. So I would say in our case, it wasn't really sort of um, that kind of an automatic process. We were just um, doing that as, as kind of more of the, the overall uh, human centered process, I suppose. Yeah. It's kind of a, a double edged sword. It's really nice in terms of styling and training to have things populated well for, for clients learning a site, uh, but it also uh, requires a little bit more QA. Um, sometimes if, unless you're using, you know, really garish or outlandish content, um, some of that placeholder content can get missed. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, I don't see any other questions. Gotcha. So yeah, I think Allison in cases like that, um, anything that's going to look broken without content, we would try and have some in there, uh, but we we don't sort of methodically populate everything. Last call for questions. So I see Allison has a, a comment in the chat here. It says an issue we have with our demo template site is example blocks or theme plus layout and stuff expects custom blocks or custom block content in the footer but we don't include it in the db in our child site so those blocks are just ugly slash broken when we clone a new site really not the end of the world just a little annoying um so i would say we probably would have um in the template site you know like uh, let's say um copyright block. Uh, there might be some boilerplate ones, but if there were additional ones that were needed on kind of a site by site basis, we would probably just add, only add those in the um, in the actual sort of like child site. Um, because we had cloned over from a, a populated site to begin with, I don't think we ran into those kinds of issues um, quite as much as it sounds like uh, maybe you have. Okay, that may be it. All right. Let's call for questions. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, um, hope everybody had a good time at GovCon. Um, Jason, are, are there any other kind of like events, social events after this, or is this kind of the wrap up? Uh, let's see. Um, I think there is. Arc social. Yep, there's some there's some stuff later on, I think. Yep. <laughs> I'm just gonna drop the link in here. Right. If I can find it. Yep, and you can always check on uh, the GovCon Slack. Um, there's there's gonna be people in there probably hanging out for a little bit too. Nice. Um, but uh, thank you so much for everybody uh, joining GovCon again uh, virtually this year. I think it was a, a pretty big success. Um, the recordings uh, for someone just mentioned recordings, all the recordings will be trimmed and edited and, and we'll be putting those in YouTube. There's uh, quite a few sessions where it started recording you know, 30 minutes before the session actually took place. So we want to make sure those are all uh, trimmed uh, as best as possible. Um, and those will be put on YouTube, the GovCon YouTube channel, uh, hopefully in the next week. We'll see. I think we may have someone working on it already. Uh, and yep. And we're having captions done professionally. So, uh, that's, that's a, a bonus there. Um, I think that's it though. Uh, thank you so much, Chris and Martin, uh, for this session. And thank you everybody again for, uh, joining Drupal GovCon this year. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.